What's up, everybody? It's Mind Pump time. Today's episode is a lot of fun. We actually interview Archie Gipps. Uh, he's one of the producers for uh, Wall Street. That's that reality show on HBO Max with Mark Wahlberg. But he's done a lot of other stuff as well. You're going to love this episode. Oh, the giveaway. That's right. We give away stuff every single time we drop an episode here on YouTube. Today, we're giving away free access to Maps Anabolic. Here's how you can win. Make sure you leave a comment in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. If we pick your comment as the best comment, you'll get free access to Maps Anabolic. But you also have to subscribe to this channel and turn on your notifications. Do those things. One more thing. We are running a sale right now on some of our most popular workout programs. Maps Aesthetics, 50% off. And our Extreme Fitness Bundle, which is multiple programs put together, is also 50% off. You can find those at mapsfitnessproducts.com. Just use the code MAYSPECIAL for the discount. All right? Enjoy this interview. Well, I can't wait to talk to you about all the, all the different companies I know that uh, Mark is running uh, alongside with you. But uh, Municipal, I know a clothing line. I, I've tried to start three different clothing lines oh, in my that's a rough one. lifetime, and that's such a headache yeah. business. And uh, I was curious to how, the, how that's going. Well, I mean, it's from the show, it's the only – you know, thing business that Mark has that you could just go online and, and you know buy something in that regard, like from the show, mm -hmm. and it's it's actually crushing right now. Oh wow! I mean, cool. it's ridiculous. Yeah, because people are. I mean, it's amazing. It's really comfortable stuff too. So it's probably because of the show, yeah, right? People watch the show, so they go straight to it and get it. Yeah, I don't know if you can see municipal. This is probably too yeah. dark. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, no, we we actually anyway. we were actually speculating off air after we were talking about uh, that show, which was a great documentary, by the way. Uh, that that business would actually be the one that would be struggling the most, and we thought what you do with Mark was probably the best business idea of all the ideas that he had because I felt like one, I mean, you guys had incredible success with McMillions. And I just feel like that's more of his wheelhouse. And you guys, I, th I thought of all the, the partnerships he's got going on, we, we thought that you guys made the best team. Well, I appreciate that. And ob obviously, I feel the same way. I mean, you know, uh, that's why I was so tremendously honored when Mark wanted to be in business with me because he's his lifeblood. He's known as an actor and a producer, right? That's how he made his, his fame and fortune. So the fact that he's willing to get into business with me in that same field was a tremendous compliment to me. And we have a lot of great stuff going on. So, um, but it's a grind. I'll tell you, man, it's, mm. it's the most, the entertainment industry is so competitive nowadays. Um, and, and you think because, you know, there's so many streamers and plays content is always in demand, but it's still a really, uh, a, a dog eat dog world out there in, in, the, in this, uh, in this industry. Yeah. It seems like it's changing a lot too, from, you know, Hollywood is going over into the streaming streaming is the biggest, uh, interest these days. And also like, it seems like a lot of people are trying to get insight into a lot of these, these Hollywood stars lives and, and what they do and how that all like plays out. And it was, I think that was what was so fascinating about, you know, that whole documentary you guys just did. Yeah. I mean, it, it it's look, uh, the great thing about it is Mark, you know, I worked on Wahlburgers with Mark, which of course was on A and E that focused really on uh, the the Wahlburgers restaurants. But it was more of like a family sitcom in a way, you know. And it dealt with the it dealt with Wahlburgers, but it was much more lighthearted. And Mark was like, I mean, he was the one. He came after we wrapped that and we started on Realistic Ideas. He's like, Archie, the next show I want to do is Wall Street. He had the name, he had everything mm -hmm. all set, and. Uh, it was really kind of figuring out what this what this style and tone would be is what we worked on. But he always wanted to be able to show viewers exactly you know what went into all of his businesses and the hard work. And it's like it's no joke as you as you guys see. I mean that guy grinds and has just the most incredible work ethic that that I've ever seen in my life. Talk about that though, Archie. What is, what is it like to take like a, a a true story, like reality, like what you got, what you're talking about right now, and and tell it in a way as a story? Like what what does that the process look like? He comes to you, hey, let's do Wall Street, and then from mm -hmm. there, I, I would think that it's kind of a handoff to you. Like, okay, now how do I yeah. piece this together and make it entertaining? Yeah, that's exactly right. And then you know, I I've worked in the industry as a showrunner and a you know a creative for many many years, so. I had very specific ideas that I bounced by Mark and it was like, Hey, 
what if we use movie clips from you know and and, and use them in a way where it kind of gives insight into what you're thinking so in giving some levity to some scenes like yeah that's cool and what about that like, we we lev and i were like we love the idea of having real ceos that could give inform viewers and inform mark like this is bit this is sort of how you do business because the key is always that mark is a great businessman but it's all instinct for him it's mm -hmm. not like he would he never went to you know business school and we love the idea of having these real executives that did go to business school and this is how things should run and juxtaposing that again with like mark and just how he does things and it's not always going to be right but in the end you know hopefully mark's always going to win it you know went out um but so we put together a team of people we hired an incredible uh group a, a crew with an amazing dp mike pepin our showrunner sarah sabitsky um a, a lot of creative people come in and we start to work on the stories but it all comes down to what's really happening in mark's life this was not like i'll tell you back in the day i worked on a lot of shows where it was much more soft scripted this is just like mark's like i'm doing this turn the camera on and and let's see what happens you know so we shot 400 hours of material wow basically for what was it the three three and three hours of yeah. content <laughs> yeah. i mean that's insane you know, if you there. think about it yeah yeah, yeah. explain All a little more down yeah explain a more detail what you mean by soft script so uh, I year back in the day I worked on the show Duck Dynasty. You know, I was just a, one of the con creative consultants. I and I helped come up with story ideas, and then they would they would kind of live those out. So, but they're all organic to to what's really happening in the person's life. So, for example, um, when and and with Wahlburgers, it's sort of the same thing. So, in an episode of Wahlburgers, Mark was going to Italy. He was filming a movie movie in Italy. So he was there. So we're like, hey, when you're in Italy, he loves wine. It's like, do you maybe want to go to a winery and and you know maybe meet up with someone and do some business for Wahlburgers at a winery? He says, yeah, that sounds great. Mm. So you, it's it's soft script because you're putting you're creating a scene in the sense that we're going to film this. But once he gets there, it's not like there are lines or anything he says. It's just whatever happens happens. But um, it wasn't, it, it's, it's not like Mark organically, uh, excuse me, was automatically going to go to that vineyard. Um, but once he went there, he kind of just did what he does. Does that make sense? No, no, totally. <laughs> and so, so when, no, it yeah. makes total sense. And so when you saw a script like that, how often do you end up having to scratch it? Cause it just doesn't play out the way you think it's going to play out. 99% of the time. That's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so why you need 400 yeah. hours of film, right? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah so, exactly. And this might this is kind of a selfish question because we have a media company, so we're always trying to figure out how to tell a story effectively. And, you know, you say something like, you know, we shot 400 hours of film and we brought it down to three. There's, I'm sure there's a structure. Like, how do you v see that? Because that's what makes you so good at what you do versus somebody else that would just film everything and then try and piece it together. What does that structure look like? What yeah. are you looking for? Well, it's just, it's tracking story. That's really what it is. It's like, you see characters like when we, with Lisa Sedler, you know, that was, she was the woman who, who owns green zebra, the healthy, um, uh, grocery store in Portland area that they're, she's trying to expand. She just was a great character. And you can really, when you met her, when you meet her, you're like, she's really dynamic. And you were like, let's track her. Let's follow her more. And we kind of knew, um, we kind of knew the characters that we were going to want to follow. I did not think that I was going to be one of the characters, <laughs> but um, it just so happened that, in that regard, the, the 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 crew when we were in the edit, they were like Archie, you have to be in this. Like you and Mark have such a real relationship that comes across. You have to be one of these characters that we're tracking in this. And I was like, okay, well, you know, so be it. Um, which is very weird to be someone that's creating the content and then having to see yourself in it is mm. was very bizarre for me because in my entire career I, I really never had that experience. Now, when you do that, are you tempted to like make yourself look, uh, you know, yeah. a certain way? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> Put you in good lighting. At yeah, least. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I will say the one thing is I did have them. I looked a little pasty in one of the interviews. Like, Give me a little more <laughs> color in my cheeks, you know. Uh, but uh, 
for the most part, I, no, I didn't. I, I actually recused myself in some of the editing of that. And I said, guys, I'm too close to this. Edit how you see fit. I'm not, I can't because, and they did, you know, and I, I, I they, they did a great job. Um, I'll tell you what, not to, you know, get, this is not about me. It's about Mark and it's Wall Street's about Mark, but I was shocked about the number of g- dads that have DM me, you know, contacted me through email or what have you like, Hey man, like such an inspiration to see you as a dad hmm. working your ass off and stuff. It really gets me emotional because it's just, you know, to have other dads reach out to me and be like, dude, like, I really appreciate what you're doing with your kid and, and working hard. It was really cool. I, I've never experienced anything like that. I'm not, I'm no celebrity. I'm just a regular guy, you know? So, um, it was cool to get that outreach. And then of course the, the outreach has been crazy on social media for, you know, people just loving Mark's work ethic, really inspiring people. And, uh, dozens of people have, have written, you know, I went to business school, but I learned more watching Wall Street than than I learned in business school. And that's just like really very powerful mm. things that people are saying that I, again, none of us really expected. We all knew that it was going to be interesting to follow Mark's life, but we never thought to that degree that it was, you know, from a business aspect that it was really really inspiring people in tremendous ways you know due to the nature of social media and how how quickly people can give you <laughs> feedback um like you said with dms does that help drive new potential stories for example you talked about so many dads that were talking about how great it was to see well, a hard-working dad that's also dedicated to his kids does something like that kind of spark your imagination and say huh i wonder if a story that revolved around you know, a well-known, you know, celebrity dad and what it's like to raise yeah. kids and stuff like that. Yeah. That's called the focus group. You're exactly right. <laughs> you're just taking, you're taking that information and you're, 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 you know, that that's hundred percent correct. And the timeliness of when it airs, it's, or you've already made your editing decisions, but in future seasons, if, if we were to get wall street to come back and we're hopeful that we'll get a season two, nothing is set yet. But you know, in that we would, we would probably entertain some of those stories that we know that really resonated with viewers for sure. Can we talk a little bit about the the financials of what that looks like, right? So, you know, right now you guys, you guys create something, HBO Max picks it up, it gets out there. What does the first season look like as far as revenue wise and how much of a bigger deal is it if they pick it up a second time? What's that like? The business model is very less sexy than people would think. Um, when it comes to limited documentary series like Wall Street, if you want to make big bucks, you're making like Survivor, you're making The Amazing Race. Mm-hmm. Those are their highly repeatable formats that you crank out. You do 20 a year, you know, 12 to 20 a year. They're on for 15 year- seasons. Those are, you know, cha-ching. The, the more, you know, we put a lot of money. What you see on film that's like high quality camera, like the best cameras in the business, the best DPs in the business, amazing editors, amazing, you know, crew. So we're from a, from a dollar standpoint, it's really not a windfall of money to us, mm. but it's really just about building up our brand and saying, Hey, unrealistic ideas creates amazing premium content. That's great to look at. They're great stories. And that to us is like sort of where we see the value so that we could continue to build and grow and sell more and more shows. And then it becomes more of a numbers game of having selling multiple, multiple projects. So are you saying like a docu-series like McMillions, which was one of my favorite documentaries, that doesn't produce a ton of money, even as, as amazing as it was and as viral as it went? Um, yeah, the short answer is no, it doesn't. Wow. It doesn't produce a ton of money. It, it, it does open up other avenues, revenue potentially, where like we could turn McMillions into a scripted project and you can mm. make ancillary ways and to flip it into other things. We did a podcast from it. I mean, look, don't get me wrong. There was, there's some money made, but it's definitely not. I mean, especially in the scripted world, the amount of money that you make in scripted TV and film like dwarfs what you make in the non-scripted mm. space. That's interesting. So when you guys did Wall Street, was part of the the strategy to use it to also spin off and maybe boost some of these businesses that are highlighted. For example, you talked about Municipal um, and uh, how it's an online business. And obviously it makes sense. People watch the show, 
boom, they can go online, buy the the clothes right away. Is that part of the strategy? Like, okay, it's going to maybe make this much money, but it's also going to allow us to- It's like a hi- marketing vessel. Yeah, highlight some of these yeah. businesses that we're doing together. Well, yeah, I mean, look, Mark's got on the record that he said he did Wahlburgers because he wanted to promote Wahlburgers, the restaurant chain, right? And yeah. through mm-hmm. that, he was able to build up that brand. So yes, that is that is definitely a consideration. Again, it doesn't, we as the creatives and you know mark separate like we 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 kind of look past all that and it's like look we're not creating a commercial here we want to do something that's highly entertaining um these are not puff pieces for these brands that mark's own the mark owns but yes of course it's it's natural branded integration right people are seeing these things they see mark wearing some of the municipal gear like oh that looks cool i'm gonna check it out and buy my own so that is inherent to it. I, um, I, I don't think it so felt... So, yeah, there is a degree. I don't think it felt that way at all. I no, thought yeah. you guys did such a phenomenal... In fact, I remember seeing it uh, a couple times being recommended to me on HBO. I passed on I didn't watch it. And then I finally clicked on an episode. And what hooked me was the fact that you guys went so deep into the behind the scenes of the business. Mm-hmm. And, it, and even though you did that, it didn't feel like you were selling me on the business. It felt like I was really getting to peer in and see what it's like to make the decisions that Mark's making on a daily basis. Yeah, it's kind of funny because, uh, you know, my brother uh, doesn't really have any idea. We're entrepreneurs, all of us in here ourselves. And, uh, you know, I, I've always tried to kind of explain what I do on a, on a daily basis. And he actually, like, stumbled upon uh, Wall Street and was like, oh, wow. He, he was getting an insight as to what, you know, that might actually look like in terms of closing deals, in terms of the hard conversations. And there was a lot of hard conversations in, in Wall Street yeah. that I think were great. Yeah, speaking of of which, as you guys are doing this, uh, pandemic uh, hits, and it, I mean, that yeah. must, that's a, I mean, talk about a wrench, right, in the machinery. Was there any, yeah. dis- were there any discussions uh, where you're like, okay, we might need to, to, to stop this, or was it like, okay, this actually is a nice twist and uh, let's keep going? I wish you were a producer at HBO Max. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll tell you why. We, we had these great, we were documenting how were we going to make this show? And we didn't, you know, to HBO Max cre- credit, they, they made some great decisions, but we, we were tracking that. How are we going to make this show? We, and we were filming our Zoom meetings of the production company where like, how do we get it? You know, it's not, you know, remember the first days of the pandemic, people didn't, no one knew anything. So mm-hmm. it took a good two months before we could sort of, figure out a game plan that was safe that was there was a you know a covid protocol as far as wearing masks social distancing so essentially one of our producers who is a friend of mark's as well would you know with and mark was comfortable enough to have him around because they're in the same sort of bubble he would just go over with his iphone and film stuff and that's how we sort of started tracking so if you notice if you're really like breaking down Wall Street, the first few episodes are shot beautifully on Amira <laughs> cameras. Like these are the best cameras in the business. And then all of a sudden it digresses to iPhone footage and Zoom footage because that's really all we could do to capture it for a while. And then it goes back to really once things eased up and we could get the, the crew in there safely and people were getting tested, we started getting more of the, the nicer shot, you know, stuff that was shot. But yes, to your point, it was a huge undertaking. That's part of all the stuff that we cut. You never saw was that behind the scenes of our company. How are we going to produce the show? How are we physically going to produce it? And I would have loved to have had it in there, but it just, you know, it's just, hmm. there's only so much you could put into this stuff. Yeah. Now the beauty is when it switches to iPhone and to that kind of zoom, it actually, it feels more real, right? Mm-hmm. Especially since all of us kind of went through that right. whole situation um, how important is it to have, I guess, in what you do, I would imagine being a positive, you know, solution based type of person, that's gotta be like a huge component to being successful at what you do because of so many things getting thrown at you all the time. Uh, you're guessing awesome questions, by the way, I must <laughs> say, um, no, yeah, I, that is what I, that's literally how I get paid. I am when, when you have something that happens on a set. And people are freaking out. Oh my God, we're supposed to shoot this at this pizza location. They're not going to let us shoot it. We're, we're screwed. We can't do anything. It's like, we're not screwed. Let's think for a second. Okay, what is this? Sto- and it all comes back to story. Mm-hmm. What are we trying to do here? What is this scene about? Mark is meeting with this pizza guy, blah, blah, blah. I'm making this up, by the way. But, you know, Mark's meeting with this pizzeria. He's going to start a pizza company now. Well, does it really have to be at a pizzeria? 
what if we shoot this? The essence of it really is that Mark is convincing this guy that he should go into the hamburger business. Again, I'm making this all up, but just for the sake of this conversation, you have to pivot on every every single time you're you're feeling something in non the non scripted world, things are falling apart, and you have to be a creative, uh, you know, uh, problem solver and on the spot make decisions because time is money, and there's literally a crew of like 15, 20 people waiting for you to make a decision of what do we do next? Hmm. You know, Archie, um, you, you know, here at what we do, we just incorporated a uh, improv instructor to help us develop that skill. I mean, are we doing the right thing? Does, does that kind of training help with that on the fly kind of thinking like, okay, what hmm. next? What do I do from here? Well, look, if you look up, if you look up Archie Gibbs, you'll see I was at the second city conservatory. I have a, you know, I grew up with improvisational training. Um, so yes, is the answer to that. It's always yes. And is, is the way that, right. uh, <laughs> you in, in the improv world, that's how it goes. And there's no, there's no point in, in freaking out. And that the other key thing is to keep, just keep your calm. And that's something that I pride myself to as, as a, uh, as an owner of this company, right. As one of the partners of this company is I never yell. I never raise my voice at any of my employees. It's, and, and people that work under me, if there's like, say a, you know, a producer, a camera operator, that's acting very aggressively or yelling at people on the set. Um, I take them aside very privately, very calmly. And I'm like, you can't, you can't behave that way because it's like, you're a leader on this thing. And you, mm. no one is going to, uh, you're not going to get more out, out of people screaming at them. Mm. You know, you're, you're going to get it out of just being a patient, listening person. And again, the thing with Mark is one of his greatest assets is he motivates you. He, and he, he, it's a little bit of tough love because he's like, hey, man, let's grind. Like, let's do Like, he inspires you to work harder, but he's not yelling at you. He's not like, you know, you suck. You didn't sell something. He's just like, come on, man. We got, we got one more in us, you know? Um, so that, that helps. And I try to, again, as, as an example to my team, I always try to, um, get people to sort of, you know, work as hard as they can work as smart as they can. Now, Arch, have you always been this guy? Now you, for the listeners that you've been an OG in this space for a long time and you've done a lot of projects. One of the things that we talk about, we've been trainers for two decades and we always share these, you know, paradigm shattering moments in our career that really evolved us as trainers and coaches what about you in, in your career? Have there been like very pivotal moments that changed your character or how you did your, your craft? Uh, yes, definitely. I, uh, uh, actually before I, I was, a, I was a pretty outgoing guy. And then I kind of like in my twenties, I came a little shy. And so I just went on this crazy road trip by myself to kind of reinvent who I am and figure out who I wanted to be. And that kind of shaped the person I am today. Um, and so that was a very pivotal moment in my life, but also then coming to Los Angeles and understanding um, sort of, I, I went to NYU for, for graduate school for film and my professor who, who is an amazing, my mentor Lorenzo Semple Jr., who, who's passed away, but he was an incredible screenwriter. And he basically said to me, you have to move to Los Angeles if you really want to make it in this industry. Because, and a lot of people that live in New York don't want to hear that because mm -hmm. New York's in, I love New York. I'm a, you know, I'm a New Yorker. I, I love it. But you need to be around creative people that you literally walk down the street, you go to a house party, you go to a restaurant, and you're meeting other directors, other writers, other actors. And that creative space, you, you cannot replicate, unfortunately. You can make it anywhere. You literally can. You just have to work that much harder. And my first job that I got out here, I was at a party, a house party. I was wearing a Mets hat, a big Mets guy and Jets, as you can see. In the, Mark loves to give it to me about being a Jets fan. <laughs> and, uh, and I was at a party wearing a Mets hat. And some guy comes up to me. He's like, hey, you're a Mets fan? We started shooting the shit. He was a New Yorker. And he goes... I'm a writer on this TV show. I'm actually leaving. I got a new job. You sound really cool. You want me to put you up for this position? Wow. I was like, hell yeah. And I went in Monday. I got an interview and I got the job. Was that blind wow. date? So that, 
Was that blind that was date? Blind date. Oh, oh, hey. Nice, nice. Yeah. yeah. Uh, very nice. Good. Yeah. Right. yeah, I found out you're uh, I was, responsible I was a- for the bubbles, right? Those those thought bubbles that oh, were above God. the guys. Yeah. That was the best part that of the show, the bro. Part. Yeah, that that was amazing. Thank you. <laughs> well, what, what, I have a hilarious story about about this. I don't, I, I, you know, but it, I was at it. So when you watch, I, can I digress? Of course, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Please do. Okay. So I was out at a bar and when you are doing blind date, those dates last like seven hours. The actual oh. raw date is like a seven hour date and you cut it down to six minutes <laughs> wow. and then you write thought bubbles to it. Like mm-hmm. I would write, you know, literally like come up with creative ideas. And so one of the, I'm out at a bar and it's because you spend so much time editing these things, the people, when you see them out and about, you're like, how do I know that person? You, Cause you do so many of them. You can't remember. And I'm like, did I go to like high school with that guy? Or like, <laughs> did I, how do I know him? He's like my brother's friend, whatever. So <laughs> I'm out at a bar and I'm just this big guy. He's like six foot two, like hockey player guy. And we're talking, we're shooting this shit. We're having a great time. And, um, and I'm like, how do I know you? He's like, dude, you don't know me. I was like, I'm telling you, I know you from somewhere. And we started listing off all these people. Do you know that? Finally, it hit me like a ton of bricks. I'm like, oh my god. And he goes, what? I'm like, I now remember how I remember who you are. I now I know how I know who you are. And he goes, what? What? I'm like, you were on Blind Date, an episode that I wrote. <laughs> and the guy just gets up, and he's big guy. He goes, dude. You made me look like an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> and I go, I go, dude, you were an asshole. <laughs> you were an asshole. <laughs> and he goes, yeah, you're right. I was. Oh, and then we just my like God, that's totally hilarious. had a great night. Oh day. my God. That, that's yeah. great. What a great story. What's 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 uh what are you most proud of in, in your projects? Wh- which one is the one that you're mo- that you look back and you go, okay, that's the one I think that's uh that I'm most proud of. I will tell you this. Um it was well, McMillions is such a tremendous success, but you know, I we obviously had a tremendous amount of you know the creative, and but I really Brian uh, Lazarte and James Hernandez, who are the directors on that, were just they're fantastic. So I kind of don't take that as my own win because those guys put so much of their blood, sweat, and tears into it, even though I'm extremely proud of that and what I what I gave to that project. I would say it's a non-scripted pro. Excuse me, it's a scripted project I did, which was called Chloe and Keith's Wedding, where I had a a video that I created purposely that I said I told people I'm like I'm going to create a video and it's going to go viral, and people are like you're out of your mind, you can't just do that, and I created a video that has over a hundred million views. Wow, which is insane, yeah. and it was uh, it's I don't know if you guys remember this, but it was. I guess like 2009, 2010, just when the internet was sort of getting going and viral was just becoming something. I did a video about a bride who gets knocked into a pool by the best man, trips and knocks into a pool. Her and the priest get knocked into a pool. And it was everywhere. It was on the Today Show. It was on Ellen. Good Morning America went viral. Um, it's, in, it's been in TV commercials, Coca-Cola commercials. Wow. I mean, it's out, insane. How did you how, and and how did you call if your you sh- actually go if you go onto yeah, Wikipedia pull it up, Doug. Pull it up. and pull they it. have the word hoax. You guys pull it up or yeah, yeah I'm, gonna, I'm gonna have Doug pull it well, up. Right so now. I know exactly yeah. what you're talking about. I've seen that video a million times in different places. The rings, please. Oh, oh god! No! no! Oh, oh my god! So that's that wasn't an actual wedding where she it was. Oh wow! I had no idea. I I I actually made that. Uh, that is a completely staged event. In fact, if you go to Wikipedia and you look up the word hoax, one of the definitions is that clip from my movie. Wow! I was like, this is what a hoax. Is. <laughs> wow! Like, I had no idea. <laughs> how did you, how did you call your oh, shot? Man. How did how did you know that you could make something that was going to go viral? Did you did you think you had the formula down? I mean, what what made you call the shot? Yes, I did. The formula was. And I did two videos for this movie, by the way, this, this thing. One was with a pet because people love their pets, silly pet videos. Mm-hmm. And the other was people love wedding mishaps. They love things that happen with weddings and people slipping up. It's like, you know, uh, and that's what I was like, OK, I'm going to have a bride get knocked into a pool. And the, the funny story is when we the first time and these are all trained actors, every single person. The guy who's the best man who slips, he's literally wearing knee pads and is in like, you know, gear so he doesn't hurt himself. 
the bride, we had practiced it. The first time we did it, she gets knocked over and she instinctively t- takes her nose and pinches the not her nostrils as if she's falling back. <laughs> and we saw it as a director. I was like, we can't use it can't yeah, do because that. there's no way you would do that. In- your instinct, you would just it's fall back. Yeah. Yeah. And so we had a, we had actually, we had rented two identical wedding dresses. So <laughs> she got into, we dried her hair off. We got her into the, you know, the fresh gown. We did it. Take two, take two. She nailed it beauty well, put wow. it up online i thought i put it online thinking i'd get like ten thousand views mm. and within a day it had a million views it was on the home page of aol this is dated you know, now i'm being dated but yeah. aol yahoo home page like it was it it blew up to such a crazy magnitude that i never anticipated wow well i mean it looks uh, again I, I, till actually right now archie i thought that was a real wedding i had no idea that that was that was scripted, so that's got to be part of that that formula. You know, earlier you mentioned the the how competitive the space is, and you mentioned streaming, and obviously now we have social media, and you know the I guess the the good of that is that the barrier to enter is so much smaller. Anybody can produce a video, but the the challenge now there's so much more competition. What are the like? How much has changed in terms of being successful today with all these new? I guess media, you know, methods of de- delivering media versus the old, you know, way where you just had TV, movie, and and that was it. Uh, yeah, I mean, you're you're exactly right. It's so it's so much more competitive because literally anyone, uh, you know, an 18 year old kid in, you know, Kansas can create something amazing, put it on the internet, and a week later he could get a Disney Plus deal. You know, I mean, there really is the the, the entry into this industry now is, is, is so low, but again, you really have to stand out. You have to make amazing content and look, it it all comes down to experience in my opinion. And, you know, we've done this for a long time. Mark, of course, and, and Lev are absolute rock stars in the, in the industry for decades. I am, have a lot of experience in the non scripted space. So you know, that's why great ideas can come from anyone. And our production company, you know, we get hit up all the time uh, about you know, pitching ideas or documentaries, and we're open to them. You know, we listen to them. And if there's a great idea, it could come from anywhere. So, and we'll partner with people. What do you um, think the percentage is of, of those ideas that get pitched to you that you take versus ones you're out seeking? Uh, it's very slim that someone does pitch us and, and we go for it. The thing that's amazing is before the pandemic, you know, I was traveling a ton and I will be traveling again soon. Um, but I would take Ubers or Lyfts a lot of places and I would just like to chat with the driver and say, Hey, I I know you're just not like a Lyft driver. What else? Or or Uber driver, what else do you do? And they would be like, Oh, I'm a, uh, just, you know, shoot the shit with them. And like, you know, they were artists or, or musicians or writers or whatever. And many times they would, they would be like, what do you do? It's like, oh, I, I have a production company. And they would, it's, oh my gosh, like I have a screenplay. Can I give it to you? I'm like, sure. <laughs> yeah. And I give them my, I give them my, I give them my business card with, that has my personal email address on it. I'm like, here it is. When it's ready to send it, I'm going to give you one shot. Don't, please don't send it to me and be like a work in progress because it doesn't help me. But if it's ready to go, send it to me and I'll see what I could do. Mm. I did that about a hundred times. I've done that over the last several years. How how many people do you think um, actually emailed me? Oh wow! You, don't tell me. You, none. Maybe zero? like two. How many? One person. Oh, one wow! Person. Hey. You know that's like uh, as trainers, we 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 figured this trick out a long time ago. Obviously, once everybody in your family and friends find out that you you train people, they want to ask you a million questions about nutrition and exercise. And so I I learned this hack like halfway through of of weeding out all the people that aren't serious and say, okay, what I need from you first is for one week, I need you to track everything you eat, then bring it to me and I'll help you. And I, I can give you the same stat back of <laughs> yep. guess how many people. Same exact thing. <laughs> wow. 100%. And you know, I, I would love to get tips from you guys, but I get a lot from my friend, Mark Wahlberg. So I'm like, <laughs> there's actually a hilarious, um, this is we so tom dowd who does performance inspired he's in wall street as well he's one of the characters mark wanted him to lose 30 pounds in in three months 
and I was supposed to gain 15 pounds <laughs> in three months. And we had a competition, oh, wow. and it was a hefty uh, amount of money that we bet. And literally, I gained 15 pounds, and it was the day of that the, the lockdown happened. And we had to cancel the bet because it was like for fairness reasons, whatever. And and we were tr- that was actually part of Wall Street. We had some of that as being tracked as well. Um, so that's just another. So I, my uh, oh, people always ask me like, all right, because I'm a slender guy, and Mark is like, come on, like he wants me to get ripped. He's like, yeah. you got the perfect frame for it. And I had many. I I know you guys know Mark's training method all too well. Um, you know, waking up at three in the morning, working out 4 a.m., you know, these are the 3 a.m. workout club or the 4 a.m. workout club. I was the 2 a.m. workout club because I'd have to wake up at 2 to go to Mark's house to film him working. <laughs> oh, my <laughs> God. <laughs> you know, so, speaking of which, I have a question yikes. for I don't know if you know the answer to this, but uh, I noticed that every time Mark works out, he wears what look like bicycle gloves. They look like the long <laughs> finger yeah, gloves. What's up with that? Do you know why he does that? Is that just a ritual thing for him? Yeah, I think his hands got his hands are really you know you know he his his one of his fingers through like when he was uh, one of his movies he was doing a I guess it must have been the fighter, and he like dislocated his finger a bit, um, so I think he just does it now. It's just a um, almost like a ritual, you know, for and getting the calluses and stuff. I, I'm I'm not 100 percent sure, but I think it's because it just is he's used to it at this point. Yeah. You know? Now. Archie, we talked about the, the the project that you were most proud of. Is there is there a project that you're you're least proud of, or is it how often <laughs> does it happen where you start something and you scratch it halfway through? Well, look, I mean, I there's, yeah, there's definitely th- you, you there's we develop so in our with our company, we've been around now for three years. I would say we've internally developed. 600 ideas wow wow of which 50 have sold or 60 let's call it 60 mm-hmm. have sold and of that 10 of them have actually made it to air wow. so it's really a weeding out process so there's just been so many things i wouldn't say i'm not proud like for example like blind date like some people would be like you know oh my god that's like you know such a cheesy show but people are like dude i love that show it's my guilty pleasure yeah. so mm-hmm. beauty is really in the eye of the beholder you know like i said i worked on duck dynasty people love that show some people think it's corny and they hate it um the shows that i've done that i've made it to air i'm, I'm pretty proud with all of them they're you know i've worked on some pretty cool shows too like i did you know two of the projects i'm really proud of two are the justin bieber feature film yeah. and the katie perry feature film both were paramount pictures i released both of those um, and I had a really a, a big part in making those films what they were. So I'm really proud of that. It's a really cool, you know, but the whole industry, it's really collaborative, you know, and it's really important that I, I never want to, um, take credit for things wholly cause it's such a team, you know, thing. And really one of the things that drove me as an entrepreneur to start my own company was I was tired of like owners of some of the places that I work just not giving me any credit for things. Mm. And I'm not even talking about like, you know, even just like, uh, hey, let me take you out to dinner because you did a great job. It, it just like, and so I try to publicly, that's why I even said at the beginning of this podcast, I was trying to give some shout outs to some of the people that worked on Wall Street. And there's dozens of people, you know, because it's it's not just me. It's not, and obviously it centers around Mark, but there's a team of people that put this together, and I think it's really important that uh, that you acknowledge those people. Is there is there a, is there a lot of uh, shadiness and politics in your space? Um, when you say shadiness, and to what degree? Uh, I mean, just uh, people. Just competitive. Pe- I mean, people stealing credit or not giving credit where it's due, or people stealing I don't know. your ideas and running with another yeah, company. I, mean, I think I will say this, not to name any names. I think there are a lot of people in this industry that are either they own companies that they take credit for things for people underneath them that are doing the hard work. I see, mm-hmm. and a lot of directors in this in this space you know, might be across multiple projects and there are people working under them that really don't get the credit that they should. I am a huge fan of editors. I love editors. 
I try to, our company prides ourselves on trying to elevate editors into becoming directors because we feel like they're the lifeblood of the documentary space. You know, those guys and gals are in the edit bay shaping stories and stuff. And a lot of times they're really not given the love that they deserve. People just see a documentary like that director was awesome. The first thing I look at is who edited it. Mm-hmm. That's literally the first person I always look at. And I want to be in business with those people. Mm-hmm. You, had, you had talked about selling uh, some of these ideas where you, you were talking about the weeding out process. What is the process of selling? Let's say you get an idea, you put it together. Now you got to go sell it. That's a whole nother monster. What does that look like? Yeah, and you said something about selling and not airing. I didn't, what's the difference? I didn't understand if you could sell something but then not air. What does that look like? Oh, yeah. First of all, it's treacherous. It's not to the faint of heart. I mean, rejection is a daily, daily thing. You're getting reject, like you're, re- you're getting rejected out of every 20 things you pitch, you're selling one, you mm-hmm. know? And so um, you put together sales material. So what will happen is let's say we come up with a great idea. Well, this is awesome. Uh, RV there yet was a perfect example. If you remember Wall Street, uh, towards the end, we were pitching the show called RV there yet. So that was about um, Mark's, it was, it was, think of like the amazing race, but in RVs across the United States with families where you had a list of things you had to do with your family. It was like a scavenger hunt oh, okay. and you drove around in your RV all around the United States. And then you came back to Columbus, Ohio, which is where Mark Wahlberg Chevrolet is an RV. <laughs> and, um, would, um, and then the winner would win like an RV. So we put together an amazing sale, like a, 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 it's called a sizzle, which is like a two to three minute video representation of what the style and tone and the concept of the show is. And we put that together with an editor, Nino Cotrero, uh, who's our amazing editor. Um, he, he's uh, on our team. So he, he cut the video and then we put together a deck, which explains exactly what the show is, what the episodes look like. So these, and this usually takes weeks, if not months to put this material together. Then you go and you pitch it. You have you identify certain buyers. You think, oh, I can I think, you know, HBO or Netflix or Discovery Plus or Hulu, whatever. Like, who are the the, the networks, the streamers, the buyers that are going to want this? And then you go out and pitch it. And now, because of the pandemic, all of the pitches are over Zoom. It used to be you go into their offices and you schmooze and then you pitch, which has made the entire pitching process very different and much more difficult way harder to read the room when you're in a zoom than if you're sitting next to someone. Um, so yeah, so to, 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 to finish up this very long way to answer to your question, um, at that point, they'd be like, we love the idea. We're not hundred percent sure if we want to go to series with it, but we'll give you a chunk of money to create a presentation or a pilot. Oh, okay. And if we like it and we really love that, then we'll buy it and then we'll air it and we'll go to series. Uh, so that that's sense. what I mean. You could sell something and and they're going to buy it, but then it doesn't make it to mm-hmm. air. Now, what, me, it doesn't make it to air. Now, who's the who's the closer for your for, for your team? Are you the one that goes? Because I know that there's people that are good at putting things together, but then there's also good people that are good at selling the idea. Is, is that you? Are you the one that also goes and sells it? Or do you have other people that are good at, at selling the ideas that you have go do this yeah. for you? Well, the ultimate closer is Mark Wahlberg. I mean, let's not kid <laughs> ourselves, right? But uh, and Mark does appear. You know, sometimes he's able to be part of the pitch pitch process and projects that make sense to him. You know, to be a part of. But yeah, I'm on that team. We have an amazing development team. Liza Keckler is our head of development. Uh, Lauren VC is our director of development. They're both awesome in pitches. Incredibly dynamic uh, women. Um, Prince Vaughn is also part of our development team. He's awesome in casting, and he's a part of some of those pitches as well. But yeah, it really depends on the project. If it's a, if it's a documentary, um, and Dave, David Wendell as well, I can't leave him out. He's also, he's one of my dearest friends. He's a part of our development team. So depending on the project, if it's like a format, which is, um, more like, again, a, a formatted series, like again, the amazing race or, uh, the uh, survivor, something that is a, a competition show. Lauren and 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 Liza specifically are experts in that, so they'll be forward in those pitches. I might come on too, but really, I'm more on the pitches for the documentary series, the premium doc space, like the McMillions, the Wall Street, mm-hmm. those type of shows. Dave and I are, are overseeing those. Now, this this question might 
put you in a little bit of an awkward position, but I got to ask it. Um, working with all these, you, you know, HBO, Hulu, Netflix, and you're pitching all these ideas. Are there certain companies that are that are notorious for being assholes, and other ones that are like great to work with? Are there, are there certain ones that everybody's like, oh man, we're gonna go pitch the. We know what a pain in the ass they are. Or certain companies that you're like, man, if we hit with them, they're so great to work with. Are you saying on the buyer side or other production? Uh, yeah, on the buyer side, yeah. Yes, there are assholes <laughs> <laughs> and great people. <laughs> I got nothing but love for HBO. I got nothing but love. No, all kidding aside, though, there are a lot of amazing buyers out there, but there are a few. I would I would be lying if I didn't say there are a few places that you just are like, uh, it's not worth it. I, and and we don't pitch to those places to be honest with you because it's just very a very frustrating process with 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 the select few. And now is that because some of these buyers are just shrewd and they're ab about themselves and trying to angle down on money wise or I mean what makes what makes one an asshole to work with or a pain in the ass? Uh, one of the things is, you know, the expectation. So it's like, hey, here you go. Here's $30,000 to make a sizzle and we need you to fly to Brazil to shoot this thing and <laughs> we want it to look incredible which is basically they're saying we expect you to you know take a hundred thousand dollars out of your pocket mm -hmm. to make sure that this thing looks good mm -hmm. so some of that is some of the expectations are not fair in my opinion they might think it's fair but I'm like it's it's really not fair because the outlay of if you're really into if they're really into it and they really earnestly want to put the money behind it and they're not, they're shortchanging it. That kind of makes it tough, but it's also just not seeing eye to eye. There's some people, again, I'm not, I, I'm not, I don't want to speak poorly of people in general, but there's some people that really are creatives that are in this space that are really great. And there's some people in this industry that don't have the experience creatively. They literally have never, they literally have never been a part of a production and physically made a production. Um, they just kind of have made their way up through the rank in different ways and now they're in a power position of power where they're talking creatively to you about things and you're when you have these conversations it's very clear from the get-go you know this person is it does it's not clear about what really goes into this and mm. it becomes frustrating you know speaking of of creative obviously you, you work with mark and he's a good friend of yours but you, you mentioned katie perry and, and justin bieber um, are there specific types of challenges working with those types of people? Because I can imagine that they all, I mean, they're all so creative that they probably have similar personalities. I mean, right. this is my, you know, my guess. Are there particular challenges with working with people like that? Yeah, for sure. I mean, definitely not with Mark. I mean, I, again, I'm going to sound like a complete kiss ass, but it's all true. I mean, Mark is literally one of the most down earth guys you'll, you'll ever meet. Like, I'm shocked that he's an international celebrity. The, the way that he treats people is insanely just down to earth. You know, I've, I've seen him, especially like the, the blue collar guys. Like when we're, if Mark, you know, goes golfing, he's talking to the, the caddies and the greens guys. And he's not really hobnobbing with other people. He's such a down to earth guy. Um, so he's like removing him from this whole thing. You know, every, everyone's different. There's certain people that are really down to earth and cool celebrities and the others that are much more difficult. Um, you know, Katie was a very intense person. She was brilliant. She literally, when we were editing that, that film, she came in and sat into the editing bay and was like working side by side with the editors. Wow. wow. So she really was invested in that film and brought, um, clearly it was about her. So she brought everything to it, but she really brought a lot of creativity to creativity to the edit itself. Um, but we, th that's also the really cool thing, which is I, I feel so uh, blessed and, 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 and really happy that I'm in Mark's universe because we get to, I get to meet so many cool people. We're doing so many cool projects with athletes and celebrities. And again, not all these shows are going to potentially go. So I can't really drop names or anything, but for the most part, all these guys and gals are like really, I mean, clearly I'm meeting them through Mark. So there's that, that whole thing where like the, there's the, uh, that, that, you know, them coming to me from that angle where they're, they're going to be nicer to me. But for the most part, a lot of these folks are really cool down earth people. And there's a few that are, are, are more demanding and difficult, but 
speaking about other projects, what uh, are we going to see something with the, the the priest? That's the head fudge, head yeah. head fudge, uh, fudge, fudge, yeah. fudge, head fudge, fudge, head fudge, head yeah. fudge. Yeah. You just, yeah, well, I think you just pitched me a new show, a priest that makes chocolate. Yeah, <laughs> yeah there's something. I there. like that. Yeah. I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pitch Food Network that one. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, we are. We're development. He is an incredible. I, I, the guy is just I off the charts at how, how we have very spirited conversations, uh, the father and I, and he's opened my eyes up to a lot of stuff financially. First of all, the guy is just, uh, uh, brilliant when it comes to, to, to analyzing financial statements, the guy's literally, it's like, what is it? Uh, the, the, uh, a beautiful mind, yeah. like that sort of mm-hmm. thing. You know, he just is, is, is incredible with, with that and dissecting it and really being able to analyze uh, companies and stocks and so forth. So yeah, we're, we're excited about that one. It's, um, it's been a little bit tricky again because of the pandemic and he's based in the East coast. And so trying to do some of that now we're easing out of it. It's going to be much, much easier coming into the summer. We're going to sort of ramp up that project. No, he's an interesting character. One of my favorite parts, actually, of the the series was when he he breaks down uh, the the zebra business, yeah. man, and just totally just, love it. just r- rips it apart. And you just don't see that coming from a father like that. I thought that was so good. Oh, and that was edited down because <laughs> he is, you know, when Mark goes, you know, I, you didn't need to be Machine Gun Kelly, you know, but right. right. like he he. He's like, and he says, like, it doesn't say anywhere in the Bible, you have to be nice. I was yeah. like, what? <laughs> what? I mean, you know, he, it was crazy. He, and he's, again, he's a really smart guy. I have nothing but respect for him. And he, he is who he is. He's a really unique character, you know, which again, this is what these things come down. I mean, if you think about it, guys, it's the characters in our lives that make these things. So that's why, you know, the father stands out so much. It's why. In McMillions, Doug Matthews, yeah, that FBI, FBI agent. Yeah. I mean, that guy is so, gold. Like, that yeah. was the one note that I kept giving. More Doug, more Doug, more <laughs> Doug. Because these these are the things that really take stories and put them over the top are the storytellers that are telling you the stories. Hmm. Yeah, if there's any, you know, aspiring producers watching this, do you have any, any you know, tips or how about this? Common mistakes. What are some common mistakes that, new producers uh, tend to make they come great question again you're, you're you're killing it here they a lot of times producers will come to us with an idea that is either not fully baked or more importantly it doesn't they're bringing no skin to the game and what i mean by that is let's just say they they say hey i've got a great idea there's you know, uh, I'm completely making this up by the way. Okay. But say there's an ice hockey team. That's all women in, in Minneapolis. And they're, uh, you know, they're great characters and, and we, I want to do the show with you. Okay, cool. Have you engaged with them? No, 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 no. Uh, you guys could do all that, but I know (laughs) of them. I've identified them and you guys could get them. It's like, no, you have to bring value. You need to go, you need to bring me, you know, videotape them get you know iphone zoom show me the characters put together a little bit of a sizzle or a casting tape and present something so you come into this with us with a value if you don't have access you need to have exclusive access so the first thing they need to do is they need to go to that the coach of the hockey team or whatever Mm -hmm. again this is all hypothetical and go hey I really think we can make a TV show out of this. I'd like to, you know, get an agreement with you to lock it up. Like I want to develop something with you. And then they need to have tape on them and then they need to write something up way too many times. People just throw ideas out lazily to us and not bring the goods themselves. Yeah. That makes a lot of mm-hmm. sense. Mm-hmm. Now, Archie, a little bit of a personal question. Um, what, what drives you? Are you, are you motivated at all by financial success? Is it all purely creative? Like what, what really drives you to continue doing what you do? It's an amazing question that I, it's definitely not money. Uh, I'll tell you that. I, 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 I feel very blessed. I have a very nice home. I mean, it's mod, it's not a mansion. It's nothing crazy. I'm a beautiful family. It's really just do, being, I'm passionate about creating projects that people relate to. I mean, again, not to break my own patting myself on the back, but if you look at my, my resume, I've been a part of a lot of really cool non-scripted shows. 
And I will say I'm my passion now work with Marcus to get more involved in scripted material too, because I have a deep love and passion for scripted. I mean, of course I want to make money, but it does not drive me in the least. Mm. It does not drive me. What it, it's really the thing that really makes my day is like when you guys say, Hey, I watched wall street. It was awesome. When I watched McMillions, it was awesome. When I go on, you know, like I said earlier, when I go on uh, Instagram and someone DMs me and is like, dude, you're an awesome dad from what I see. The show is awesome. That to me, if you can inspire people and entertain people and specifically make people feel better about life, it's tough, man. Life is tough. And especially now with the pandemic, if I could in some small way create some bit of content that's going to take people's minds off of that and, and let them enjoy life and learn from it. That to me inspires me and, and, and motivates me to create. And I also, I, I, I don't know where, how I was hardwired to, with my drive. It's Mark is the youngest of nine kids. So I know, and I know his family very well. I literally am friends with friendly with all of his brothers and he is so motivated to succeed because he was the youngest of nine and his motor is running because it's like, I got it. I got to compete with my brothers. Now it's not that anymore. He's not competing with his brothers anymore, but he's found other people to kind of internally, you know, motivate him. And I, you know, I had five people, you know, kids in our, my family as well. And so I had that competitive spirit with my siblings. Um, so I think there's something of that in that too with me, but, um, I don't know. I, I, it's hard to say. I mean, you guys all are you know, certainly motivated guys and crushing it. Like you're just hardwired that way, you know, like, mm -hmm. I, and I have friends who are like lazy and they're not doing things. They're really talented guys. And I'm like, come up with a show <laughs> idea. Pitch me a script. I will, I will sell this. I promise. <laughs> I mean, they're smart guys. They don't do it. I just, and I, for the life of me, I'm like, what's going on? Like, I, I'm not wired that way. I cannot for the life of me understand how someone can't be like excited and, and, and driven to like do things in life and feel good about like creating things. It just, I, I don't, I don't understand. Yeah, no, I appreciate that answer. And, and w one more question, you know, uh, you, you, we mentioned dads and we mentioned how that's, that really strikes a, a, it seems to resonate with a lot of people balancing being a father and balancing the drive that you have to yeah. do what you do. Cause what you do is, I mean, it's a lot of work. Oftentimes, I'm sure you're not home. You're in other places. Like, how do you balance those two out? What does that look like? It's raw. I mean, during the pandemic, which you got a little glimpse of in Wall Street. I mean, it is. It's impossible when the kids were at home. I, my wife and I. My wife, God bless her. She is a full time lawyer at a very big movie studio out here in Los Angeles. She's one of the head lawyers in the in in the film department. And so we're both working from home and we had our two, a five-year-old and a two-year-old. And we had to have like break things up where like I, we had classes. So we, we each took half hour shifts where it'd be like, we'd have a drawing class and we'd have a dance class for our kids. Cause we had no, na there's no nanny here. There's no other people. I'm not like, you know, uh, it was just my wife and I. So we had to divide our day from doing our jobs. And again, I don't want to sound because to me, it's not work. My, I, I love what I do. So when I go wake up in the morning, I'm like, I'm living life. And it just so happens my life is my kids and my wife and my work. So I think really the one place where I, it, I is a very important in Hollywood, especially post pandemic is the schmooze. Like you go out for drinks, you go out for dinner. That's where a lot of business gets done in Hollywood. And I will not go out for drinks or dinner until my kids are asleep. Mm. So normally people go out from six o'clock to eight o'clock is like happy hour dinners, whatever. I've told my, you know, my assistant knows and, and my team knows like from six to nine, I am home with my family. I'm having dinner. I'm, I'm reading stories to my kids. We're playing. I'm tucking them into bed, what have you. And then I'll go out for late night drinks. If, if people want to meet from nine to 11 to midnight, whatever. I burn the midnight oil. You know, that's one of, that's the thing. Like Mark gets his, goes to bed at seven, you know, to get up for his workouts. I go to bed at two 30 in the morning. You know, that's, that's where my grind is late at night because I got so much stuff to go through. Again, I don't want to sound like I'm like, you know, talking up my life here, but it's a grind. Like you got to make those sacrifices. For me, the sacrifice is to be with my family 
I got to work late hours to catch up on watching. You know, I got tons of things I got to watch. I got emails to return. And that sweet spot for me is like 11 to like 1, 1 30 in the morning. Well, Archie, we appreciate what you do. And, and thank yeah. you very much for coming on the show. This was a lot of fun. It was yeah. great. I appreciate it, guys. Thanks for having me. And uh, let's keep in touch. And uh, let's, uh, you know, good luck with everything you're doing. Self-image is, am I a person worthy of being taken care of? Am I a human worthy of some dignity, some respect? I have some good qualities to me. I'm not a bad person. Body image is just objective. I look in the mirror. I'm short. I'm tall. I'm hairy, bald, or I'm fat, or I'm overweight. <laughs> and 